at Facebook, we have this idea of something that's called the, uh, the social graph. And the social graph is, is the concept that people, uh, they share information uh, through their friends and the people around them. And if you were to map out all of these different connections, it would form this graph with very literally billions of connections, if you could imagine that. And, and this is what we call the social graph. And, and at Facebook, uh, the concept, the idea is we map out all of these connections to the social graph as accurately as possible uh, using you know, your real world identity and, and hopefully your real world relationships. And once we've mapped out these connections, uh, we can use them to help people share information more effectively uh, to make it a, a lower transaction cost to, to share information and, and engagement. And, and the social graph is the network of connections to which these people communicate and share information. And, and that's why one of the reasons that we tend to refer to ourselves as a, a social utility at Facebook. We find ourselves as, as more of a utility that people use uh, within their own lives and within their own social graph, as we like to call it. Um, and the idea and the concept of a social graph is, in fact, not a new one to politics. Um, it might have gotten a little bit lost in the broadcast era, um, but the, the data has long shown that peer-to-peer, neighbor-to-neighbor messaging is, is the most effective in politics. It's more effective than direct mail or television ads. Um, you saw a great example of this in, in 04 with the Bush-Cheney neighbor-to-neighbor program and, and different things like that. And it's uh, organizing by many of the campaigns uh, has been kind of rediscovered uh, this cycle on its most basic level. Um, now, at Facebook, we've We've really built something that I think first empowers an individual within their own social graph, within their own set of friends and acquaintances. Uh, and one of the things that happens between people, between friends, is that people talk about politics and philanthropy and things like that. Um, let me just throw, a, throw an example out there. We partnered with ABC News to do so, a presidential debate and to do some coverage of Super Tuesday on February 5th, and, and we had a kind of a public discussion uh, on the politics application, and, and over 100,000 people pub on Facebook publicly commented on February 5th alone, um, and the numbers were you know higher before and after that. Um, uh, but I think the key concept there, and that's a, that's a huge number for one day, but uh, these were the public conversations, and there are far, far, far more conversations that we can't necessarily see in public going on on Facebook uh, between friends. Um, in the same way that friends talk about politics around the water cooler or coworkers or the same thing. Um, and, and this is actually borne out by the data. Uh, Harvard Institute of Politics just released their uh, biannual youth survey, and they found that 37% of college students and a full 23% of young people uh, had used Facebook to promote uh, a candidate event or idea. Uh, this is Facebook specific, and that's very important because uh, on Facebook we have something that's called the news feed, which aggregates the data uh, uh, from your friends and, and lets you know about some of the actions they're taking, the events that they've been to, things like that. Uh, and, and the viral power is when I broadcast something out on Facebook, uh, hundreds of my friends can see it. So if 23% of uh, Facebook users are using it to talk about politics, it means that much, much larger part of the Facebook population has been exposed to a friend or acquaintance talking about uh, politics or uh, online uh, on Facebook. Um, I want to segue for a moment into the, the concept of micro-targeting, which is kind of all the rage right now in politics. Uh, and the idea, I know that uh, one of Patrick's little coworkers, Michael Turk, was speaking at IPTI a few weeks ago and saying, you know, we could purchase 150 different characteristics in the Bush campaign to target against and kind of accurately predict uh, things like that. And, and at Facebook, we have some very powerful paid targeting capabilities that stem from the fact that much of the online identity we have on Facebook is people's real identity and their real preferences and stuff. But uh, one of the things that I'm seeing increasingly is the idea that, that individuals within their own social graph uh, can target more effectively than 200 or 300 characteristics purchased from a database because uh, inherently as a human being with a relationship you have with someone, you know how to tailor your arguments. You know maybe what their issues are most important to them. And so you are able to serve as a, a very effective micro-targeter and advocate for a campaign or a cause. Um, it's kind of a concept I call the individual coordinated campaign. Uh, for those of you familiar with politics, the, the idea of a coordinated campaign is that you know national, state, and local uh, campaigns will work in sync to try and drive the message out at all levels. And uh, I think that with the individual coordinated campaign uh, working in sync with paid advertising with some of the free tools with different things like that and the advocating individual can really bring the whole message across many of these multi-channels. Um, since we're here to talk a little bit about philanthropy and advocacy, I think that 
uh, one of the things I alluded to earlier, that it's uh, very much first empowers individuals, can make it a little bit more of a challenge for, for organizations, particularly organizations uh, used to operating in a broadcast era. Uh, and that's something that we're seeing across the board. Um, and one of the things that, that's important for Facebook is, is we have to balance the tools we provide between the, the needs of organizers and the needs of users. Uh, and to skew too far in one direction or the other uh, is a tough balancing act that we've had to maintain. And I've gotten users mad at me and organizers mad at me for the same thing. And so I think it's always important to keep that perspective. But um, just as I talked about individuals, your organizations are made up of these very passionate individuals. Uh, and harnessing them on Facebook and in another organization, uh, organizational capacities, I think, is a, is a key there. Um, you know, the initial cost of maybe being on Facebook, creating a page, a cause, or a group is, is maybe minimal and, and a, a small investment. Uh, but some of the returns can be great even with, with a minimal investment. Uh, if you're out there on Facebook and maybe not promoting yourself, uh, one of the first things you'll see is people will find you and, and follow you or become a fan, um, which is fascinating. These people are seeking you out. These, these are people who have decided to seek you out on their own and, and affiliate with you on their own. And so it means there's a, a connection there, uh, one that I think is, is a very powerful one. Um, anyone who's ever run a mass email list knows that there are some people who will always take action uh, when you send them an email and send them an ask. Uh, and, and as I like to call them, they're, they're digital ones and twos, which is a field terminology out of politics, that ones and twos are the ones who are likely to advocate and take action. Um, and, and the idea is that it's a great place to start with these digital ones and twos on Facebook and, and other mechanisms. Um, you know, just some simple things. Repurposing content on, on a place like Facebook can be very powerful. Uh, I love to use the example. There was a, a photo I saw once of, of Barack Obama with someone at a rally. And uh, had the Obama campaign put this on their website, maybe 10 people would have clicked through all the different links you had to do to get to this photo and seen it. Uh, but they put it on Facebook or, and someone recognized the person and tagged their friend in it. You know, it was Brian or Bob or whoever. Uh, and so all of a sudden, all of Bob's friends saw, hey, that's a photo of Bob with Barack Obama. And so one of them comments on that. So now the commenter's friends and Bob's friends have all seen this photo of him with Barack Obama. And another friend comments, and this, all of a sudden, this photo that might have only been viewed by 10 people on the Obama website has been viewed by hundreds or even thousands of people. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I think that's a, a very powerful thing. Um, you know, Convio I know makes Facebook applications with our Facebook platform, we've each opened up our API and allow people to, to build applications. Uh, Facebook Causes has been uh, great for raising money, uh, different things like that. One of the things we're seeing that's, uh, again, a little bit under the radar because people's privacy settings on Facebook are very powerful and you can't see everyone's profile. Uh, you're seeing a lot of information spreading uh, on the individual and the small social graph level. So people fundraising, for instance, for really for life within their social graphs. I know uh, I've been asked several times and very popular. Um, you know, uh, one of the things we're seeing is people put more and more information on these sites. You know, I've learned about uh, weddings, babies and even deaths from Facebook. And as people particularly say with the American Cancer Society, you know, are diagnosed with these things, they are going to find support. They're going to use that as a mechanism to inform their friends. They're going to, and, and also an advocacy opportunity to, to teach them more about it, to spread awareness. And I think there's a, a huge thing there. Um, and then I guess the final point I'll touch on is uh, Facebook and the internet and, and other things have really lowered the barrier for a lot of participation in politics and advocacy and, and philanthropy. Um, but this isn't happening in a vacuum. So it's happening for all these organizations. So you're now competing on a, you know, with all of these people with a lower barrier of entry. And, and this mirrors uh, real life. Uh, there are hundreds of good causes, thousands, millions of good causes of, of candidates and campaigns. And so uh, cutting through the clutter isn't just something that exists in the internet. It's, it's a reflection of, of real life relationship there too. And so how campaigns and how organizations elevate themselves in this environment I think is very important. Um, you know, I guess the final point I'd say is, uh, you know, we have lots of great examples in the advocacy world and, and the political world. Um, I don't have as many from the philanthropy world, and I am fascinated in here to encourage people to, to really get in this space and experiment and find out what's going to work in this world so that I have more great examples to share in the future and the, the cycle continue itself. So thank you.